Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's go outdoors. Let's go outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Conserving Alberta's wild side. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. Coming up, we take to the ice to learn more about the importance of lake aeration in the winter months. Fish Stocking is one of the programs run by the Alberta Conservation Association that provides additional angling opportunities for Albertans. We'll also be hopping a snow machine and sharing some backcountry riding footage with you. Brad Fenson from the Alberta Fish and Game Association will be along with a few tips on capturing that perfect wildlife shot. At one time, the trumpeter swan was all but gone from North America, but thanks to some conservation efforts, we've seen some of the largest swan numbers in over a decade. <laughs> and we'll be joined in studio just a little later on to get some information about the minister's special license designed to raise money for a number of conservation programs here in Alberta. Once again, a pleasure to be coming to you from the Wild Alberta Gallery here at the Royal Alberta Museum. But before we get too comfortable with these surroundings, let's head out for a little snow sledding fun. We start our adventure along a new trail that was developed by the Alberta Snowmobile Association up in the Nordegg area. This is my first experience at heading into the wilderness snow sledding. So when I arrived at the staging area just outside Nordegg to meet the folks from the Alberta Snowmobile Association, I was pretty excited. And with that snow falling, I'm optimistic the conditions along the trail are going to be pretty good. After a brief on where we were going and to keep our eye open for each other, it was time to roll out. I'm heading out with members of the Alberta Snowmobile Association who, with the help of some 35 clubs across the province, manage close to 5,500 kilometres of trails. For someone like me getting into this activity, I'm thankful to have the experience of these folks to help guide me. Well, your best bet is to either call the Alberta Snowmobile Association and find out what club is close to you, your area, get a hold of your local club, and they would be more than happy to take you out on a ride. They'll suit you all up. Most people have extra helmets, boots, mitts, gear, sleds. They'll get you up, teach you some safety things, and take you out on a little ride to see if you like it or not. We're more than happy to take a friend snowmobiling. Even the most seasoned of backcountry snowmobiler won't tackle this area on their own. No, like even I wouldn't come out here without, without Wes or somebody from the local area. So we have no map, there is no signs. So he's taking us off out into the wilderness. He works out here, he knows the area. You never want to come out here alone. You never want to snowmobile alone, and you don't want to go to the backcountry alone. And really, why wouldn't you want to share a day like this with friends? After all, who, if not your friends, are going to haul firewood, start the fire, and offer you hot dogs? In fact, it seems snowmobilers and outdoor food go hand in hand as I discovered on yet another trip. This time around, the snowmobile capital of Alberta, White Court. This is one of the biggest snowmobile rallies of the season. Even the mayor of White Court clears his calendar to attend. And as for that moniker of snowmobile capital of Alberta, well, that just sits fine with the mayor. Oh, you betcha, it's one that we wear with pride. Uh, we actually had it copyrighted so that nobody else could take it because uh, there was some other, you know, pretenders to the throne that uh, did want it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, we probably have one of the greatest snowmobile clubs uh, 
in Alberta here and it's been around for I think 30, 32 years now and uh, we have great trails. Uh, I, I can't remember the, the exact kilometers that they have but uh, with the Golden Triangle I think it's over 300 kilometers of groomed trails that they have here. And we have great snow and great scenery and what else could you want? Apart from eating all those hot dogs, the other highlight was getting a chance to meet a number of families who love a day out. Every year we're here, yeah, spending time with our family as well as keeping them outside and uh, hopefully teaching them to... Uh, That's my whistle. <laughs> to do stuff outside as opposed to staying in the house watching TV. Well, if you keep them warm, you keep them happy. That's bring lots of snacks and extra gloves. Hot chocolate, hot dogs. Yeah, that always helps. <laughs> and nothing like fresh air and a full belly to take the edge off this young rider. Sleeping kids were not the only attention getter. Some of the machines turned heads as well. With some basic instruction on the key components of my machine, I was finally ready to head off. This is my uh, steed, so walk me through it. What your am I getting myself into here, Your man? trusty steed for the day. So it's a Polaris sled. Uh, basically, you just got the key to turn on, then you got your uh, kill switch to pull up for you. Kill switch, uh, oh good. So All if right. you're in a panic, things are going wrong, just push the kill switch down, it'll kill the sled. Oh, wait a minute, did he say kill switch? What am I getting myself into here? Well, throwing caution to the wind, it's time to get on the trail, and what a trail it is. This is just a small section of what's referred to as the Golden Triangle. Heading out with me is Richard Wong, the Vice President of Travel Alberta, originally from Fiji. This is Richard's first snowmobile experience. Well, it's a unique experience, obviously, going from a very warm tropical climate a number of years ago, uh, now a Canadian, uh, and having to experience the great things here in Alberta. Certainly, sledding is a big piece for that. Of course, snowmobiling is a significant winter tourism activity. Uh, Travel Alberta's goal is to grow tourism revenues by a billion dollars by 2017. So snowmobiling is uh, about a $350 million uh, industry here in Alberta. As we continue our 30-kilometer trek back towards Whitecourt, we had a chance to stop along the trail and discuss the relationship that's developing between outdoor recreational users and industry. As you see behind us, there's a, a, either a lease being built here or the, uh, the forest industry is going to do some logging here. This could be an access road. So what happens is there's communication between the club and also the forest industry. And uh, this is the result of it. You can actually see that they actually didn't do any work here so we could have our poker rally. Now just before we reached the end of the trail we had to cross the river and knowing conditions were safe we had to open up the throttle. Getting my adrenaline back into check we made the final push back to the registration area and for some final words from the most important participants of the day. Did you have a good time? Yes. What was your favorite part about being out on the snow machine? Uh, going over the big hills. Going over the big hills. So are you ready to ride your next one all by yourself? Yeah. Coming up, our winter theme continues with a look at how an aeration program is helping to keep fish healthy during long winters. Canada's cold water resources need you. Trout Unlimited Canada delivers conservation results for our freshwater ecosystems and their cold water resources. Our work includes stream restoration, scientific research, and education through our Yellowfish Road program. There is no denying the fact that society's thirst for natural energy grows almost on a day-to-day -day basis. The big question becomes, how do we extract this natural resource in a responsible manner? I'm confident that we can coexist on the landscape. Uh, it's all, for me, it all comes down to good science. As a biologist, that's what I am, a scientist. And uh, that's one of my roles here at Devon, is bringing that science, going out in the bush and, and tramping around and collecting data, but then also making sure that we can make sure that good science leads to good policy and you know we do a lot of uh, field work but then spend a lot of time in boardrooms and, and, and meeting rooms doing doing policy work and, and developing guidelines and recommendations for land use and those kinds of things so uh, certainly I think there's uh, 
uh, an, an opportunity for development to coexist with wildlife conservation. Talk to us about how you came into this position. What, what prompted you to say, yeah, I want to go work for a, for a large oil company? I'm a wildlife biologist, as you say. That's my background is as a large carnivore biologist, actually. I've done a lot of work with uh, bears and wolves all over North America. And uh, I spent a lot of time actually doing a lot of consulting as well after that. And as a consultant, I started working a lot with the oil and gas industry, doing uh, environmental assessments and environmental planning and permitting for oil companies. And the natural progression from there was just to start uh, coming on board with the oil companies. Uh, a company like Devon has some really core values center, centered around things like integrity and doing the right thing, being a good neighbor. Uh, really important to, in order to do those things, you have to have some really strong land stewardship principles. And those are the kinds of things that, uh, that I do at Devon. Well, it may look good on paper to have a professional biologist on staff. The bottom line, does he have any impact when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations? I'm really happy to say that as a professional biologist, uh, it's really easy for me to, to step up to the plate and give my opinion on, on some of these resource development plays. We get our engineers come in and talk to us about, uh, about putting a, a pipeline into a certain place and they've got maps and, and, and approved plans, but uh, they give me the power to be able to give my opinion about what, those, what the impacts of those might be. And we have actually had instances where we've, got, we've had our development guys go back and, and move pipelines and well sites and replan entire projects based on wildlife habitat concerns that, uh, that I've brought up. So there's definitely that opportunity there. Cold, long winters can take a heavy toll on our fish populations. It's one of the reasons the Alberta Conservation Association has invested in a number of stocked lake aeration projects. ACA biologist Kevin Fitzsimmons heads up the program. We have a number of uh, water bodies in Alberta that we stock with fish that are typically shallow, have a high productivity, and this leads to the lake frequently uh, winter kill or summer kill uh, events where the fish will then not make it through a full year. Of course, we only have so many lakes, rivers and streams in our province that can support fish stock. So providing aeration during the winter months ensures the viability of fishing opportunities. Alberta has roughly 300,000 anglers and uh, about 800 lakes and 1,500 streams that with self-sustaining fish populations. That works out to about 800 anglers per lake in Alberta compared to, say, Saskatchewan, where it's about three anglers per lake, or two or three anglers per lake. So we have uh, quite a few anglers and uh, not a lot of water sustaining fish. So we've created these angling opportunities to uh, provide for anglers and to take some of the pressure off the native stocks whose status is often uncertain. So just what does an aeration system do? It uh, essentially is just like a uh, aquarium bubbler on a larger scale. These lakes are typically shallow. They typically have high biological oxygen demand. And without um, actually adding oxygen to the water, throughout the winter, these lakes, the oxygen level will drop below what is necessary for the survival of the trout. And once it gets to that point, they simply uh, have a winter kill event and there's no fish left in the spring. And what makes a lake a good candidate to be aerated? In this case, we're talking about Birch Lake, just outside the Rocky Mountain House area. Since 1983, Alberta Sustainable Resource Development uh, stocked this water body and uh, they're stocking it with uh, brook trout and every two to three years the lake would die off due to oxygen depletion in the winter. Uh, we thought, you know, it, suitable size, suitable uh, depths and such and uh, we identified it as being, as being a water body that would be uh, conducive to uh, enhancement. In fact, the ACA program is seen as a positive move by the provincial government. Obviously, aeration can uh, mitigate a kill, uh, perhaps even prevent a kill. So again, it's all about uh, conserving the resource, sustaining the resource, and uh, making sure that we have uh, good fishing opportunities for recreational anglers. And uh, the ACA is making a great contribution by, by helping us out with, with aeration. Coming up, we look at the return of the trumpeter swan. Alberta Conservation Association. Since 1997, more than $120 million has gone towards conserving wildlife and fish and securing habitat, creating a lasting legacy for Albertans. 
One of the themes you're going to hear an awful lot on this program is the role that hunters play in conservation programs and to help us walk through one of the latest ones that's actually been around for a while, a real pleasure to welcome Kelly Semple, woman of many hats. Kelly, I, I always have to ask you, what hat are you wearing today? Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Give us a little bit of background. Uh, what was the reasoning for uh, the minister's uh, special, I guess it comes in two, uh, a raffle and then there's also a, uh, uh, a special um, auction that's taken down in the United States. The permits started in 1995 and they were really designed to uh, serve as a fundraiser. So the species at the time were uh, bighorn sheep and elk and so two permits were taken to the U.S. and they were sold through an auction process and they were sold to the highest bidder obviously and then in Alberta raffle tickets were sold that were only eligible to Alberta residents only and under all of the rules of the Alberta gaming regulations that apply. And so so from year to year those permits have been available and uh, a few years ago we added a mule deer permit as well. Over the period of the program starting, we've raised over six million dollars that has come back to Alberta and has been reinvested into habitat projects, into wildlife projects, into inventory counts, into education programs, fencing programs, you name it. Uh, it's come back to Alberta on the ground. So, it, you know, you started the program by talking about the contributions of hunters and that really is the case because the buyers of this are simply hunters. These are people who want an opportunity to be able to get that special license and have an extended hunting season and in the case of the auctions or even the raffle tickets some of them are prepared to spend a considerable amount of money to get that opportunity and they're quite happy that they know that money's coming back here to Alberta and it's on the ground and it's doing good work. You've already sold the, um, the U.S. version. Um, the Alberta uh, raffle starts when and goes to when, Kelly? Started January 1st and uh, the draw takes place at the Outdoor Women's Program, which we host at Alfred Lake. So we have about 250 ladies there who witness the draw and uh, that's on August the 12th. The raffle uh, regulations are very, very specific in Alberta and they're monitored very carefully and we're, we're very uh, careful about adhering to them and one of the things is is that that the raffle winner is not transferable so whose ever name is on that ticket they have to make use of it the other question that we often get is that why is it that you know you can buy so many tickets or why is it that it's not regulated so it's more fair for you and I and and that those are regulations that are handled through the Gaming Commission and there's nothing that prohibits in fact it's unlawful to limit the number of tickets that anyone can buy at no different than a 649 or any other raffle. Well I gotta think though I mean at, at the end of the day if it's if, if the raffle is designed to generate funds for the outdoors and for conservation groups, then you would want to sell as many as you, as you possibly can. Our objective is to sell as many tickets as possible because that uh, combined with the auction permits that are sold, that's what generates the pool of money that will fund conservation projects next year. Kelly, thanks so much for coming in and sharing that information with us today. You're welcome, thank you. Coming up, Brad Fenson will be along with some tips to capture some great wildlife pictures. Pheasants Forever celebrates its 20th year in Alberta in 2012. We are dedicated to the conservation of pheasants and other upland wildlife through habitat improvements, public awareness, education, and land management policies and programs. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with Alberta Fish and Game Association with your outdoor tip. I love wildlife photography. I started about 25 years ago and people often ask me, how do you get those images? Well, part of my seminars I go over that. If you want to shoot wildlife photography, you really need to invest in the right equipment. You know, there's lots of different cameras on the market like these point and shoots, which are great for doing family and friend things out in the outdoors to capture those special moments when you're up close. But if you want to capture wildlife in their natural setting like this, I mean, we're out here and there's mallards flying around and Canada geese and the shovelers working the points. You know, even smaller lenses like this aren't going to generate very good photos for you. So you have to think bigger. And this is the lens that I use for shooting wildlife photography. It's a 400, so it's not really big, but uh, it extends out and it allows you to capture 
the wildlife at a distance. You don't have to get too close to disturb them, but it allows you to get those nice, clear, sharp shots when you're out in the field. You'll also notice that I have a tripod with me. I never shoot wildlife stuff freehand unless I'm absolutely forced to. The new cameras nowadays are great because they actually have stabilizers built into them, and this has a, a one and two phase stabilizer so I can actually hand hold it, move the camera, and stop the action of a bird in the air. So it does come in handy, but if you shoot it off a tripod, you're just guaranteed to get a little bit more crisp images, and that's really what you want. If you want a really outstanding picture, you want it to be clear and crisp and really have the definition of our wildlife. You look at the birds at this time of year, they have incredible colors, like the green in the mallard's head and uh, the different rust and green in those uh, shovelers that are out here. You want to capture that and get it in your photographs. There's a variety of different cameras you can get into, they're not that expensive, and you can get started right away. put it in a bucket. If you're new to fishing or perhaps have a young family that's never experienced uh, an angling adventure, it's uh, ponds like this one here in Beaumont that can provide just a great opportunity to the new angler. Even seasoned anglers, for that matter, can come out and sharpen their skills for the upcoming season. The Alberta Conservation Association puts on a fish stocking program on a yearly basis and uh, drops about 15,000 fish into ponds like this throughout Alberta. What are you testing? I'm just testing uh, quickly the oxygen levels and temperature of the water to record. It has to be above five. Uh, milligrams per liter before we can stock. The ACA started our enhanced fish stocking program really to address uh, an interest in anglers in catching larger fish and also looking at overwintering some of the existing fisheries that we had. We also use it as a program to supplement what the what the government does for their stocking and we add an additional about 61 ponds and we stock nearly 300,000 trout and we focus on stocking a little bit larger fish than typical uh, government stocking programs just to give a little bit of uh, uh, an added incentive to anglers. What do you guys think of all this? It's awesome. That's one thing we focus on, stocking ponds close to major centres. Edmonton, Calgary, we have quite a few in the northwest. Uh, places where fishing opportunities aren't readily available. Ponds like this where we're focusing on put and take, certainly we are encouraging folks to come out and they can keep some fish and take them home. So if you look at the Discover Guide, uh, you can get directions, you can get locations to all those uh, ponds. We launched our app, available free from the, uh, from the iTunes store, and that'll give you interactive directions to those same sites. Just a great way for people to, to get out there, access the site, find out where they're going. 15 minutes drive, you can have a picnic, you can stop, you can wet a line and uh, test your luck at catching a fish. Wild Sheep Foundation Alberta promotes and enhances wild sheep populations and habitat through the funding of programs that support responsible wildlife management, conservation education, youth involvement, and the preservation of our hunting heritage. You know, the appearance of the grizzly bear often signals the beginning of spring. And for the folks up in Grand Prairie, uh, the spring fever starts with the return of the trumpeter swan. Now I caught up with Margot Herview. She's with Alberta Parks and gives us some background on the trumpeter's breeding ground. People have recognized for a long time that trumpeter swans are a very important part of the area around Grand Prairie. Uh, this is the historical core nesting area for trumpeter swans for all of the swans that nest west of the east of the Rocky Mountains. So the all of the birds that are in the Yukon and northern BC and Alberta. This is the core area where they were historically nesting and then they have spread into other areas from there. So the swans have been part of the history of the Grand Prairie region since the Europeans have moved into the area. Of course, the return of the swans also means a return of visitors to the area. It's definitely a, a draw for people. We get people from uh, all over the, the South Peace region come into the festival every year. We've also had guests from places as far away as Edmonton, Calgary, and even from the New York one year and uh, even Europe. So we do get people that come to see swans. People around Grand Prairie actually take them for granted a little bit because you do see them on a regular basis, but don't realize that for people in other parts of North America, it is a really special bird to see. One of the challenges swans have is being able to find enough room so that they can raise their young without any interference from us. 
The important thing for swans is having undisturbed lakes that they can raise their cygnets on. The Grand Prairie area is really good for that because there are a lot of little lakes in the area, so you get a pair of swans on each lake and they have the habitat that they need. But people also love to live besides lakes as well, and so the important thing is to be really good neighbours, making sure that we don't disturb the shorelines, giving them a buffer against disturbance. Uh, there are rules in place so that industrial activity has to provide those buffers around swan nesting lakes as well when you start to get into some of the forested regions. One of the big threats is actually power lines for adult swans. Um, there are, we find at least a half a dozen dead adults at, who have collided with power lines in the Grand Prairie area every year and odds are many more are actually colliding with them. So it's that whole development kind of thing that, that it's just making sure that there aren't too many things that are disturbing them and trying to make sure that we maintain all of these little lakes in a, in a pristine fashion so that they have the habitat that they need. There are about 2,000 birds in the population that lives on the east side of the Rocky Mountains and then there's another few thousand birds that nest in Alaska and move up and down the west coast. So the birds are doing quite well. Uh, there seems there's lots of lakes for them to live on and move on. You can't hunt trumpeter swans anymore. You can't use your, their feathers for quills or any of the things that were historically used on the birds. So um, as long as we can maintain the habitat both for their wintering areas and the nesting habitat, keep them as undisturbed as possible, then the, the prognosis is pretty good. Just how sensitive these birds are to human encroachment is the subject of a current study undertaken by University of Alberta master's student Jared Loft. And the purpose of what I'm doing is to kind of help relate uh, how human disturbance is affecting the trumpeter swans breeding population. Um, in Grand Prairie there's kind of an interesting situation here where yeah the swans there's a subpopulation of the swans that are nesting in these agricultural lakes that are real close to human uh, activity uh, compared to most of the trumpeter swans which nest in more remote areas. And I'm trying to look at to see how, how them being in this more human, uh, human disturbed environment may uh, be affecting their population growth and especially the number of cygnets they're raising each year. I'll personally go out to these lakes and kind of test to see how easily they're disturbed by human presence, which um, of course I, I'm noticing is a lot lot larger in the remote areas than it is here in the agriculture areas. Current regulations state that there must be at least an 800 meter buffer between any development and nesting swans. Canon asks 911 dispatch, what's the location of your emergency? 10-4, so just to confirm then, 30 years of age, female, head injury from a fall in grill mars. We're just hauling somebody off the slope. While this call was part of a training exercise, conservation officers who are a part of the Alberta Parks Public Safety Team in K-Country respond on average to more than 350 calls a year. Down slow. In order to keep rescue skills sharp, team members go through ongoing training throughout the year to refresh their skills. Various rescue techniques along with intricate rope work are all part of the training program. Rope rescue operations are defined in terms of the steepness of the terrain. In this case, it's pretty well straight down. Part of the day will focus on high angle rescue operations, which involve unique hazards and require special skills to be able to perform them safely. Okay, they're just coming to the edge now. Perfect, right on. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at building a tripod on the edge which is going to actually raise it now, so our edge person isn't going to have to make that transition anymore. The rope is going to be supported up and above, and we're going to have our belay line on the ground. Once the system is in place, ropes have been checked. This mock rescue can be safely carried out. He'll go down below. We'll get him into the edge protection. We'll keep going down. He's going to get to the uh, overhang, and we're actually going to see him going to climb up into the high point. No one sets out for a backcountry adventure thinking they're going to be needing a rescue. But like a good insurance policy, the highly trained public safety team is there to provide help. Oh, that's so much easier with that pole. Hey, if you would like to catch previous stories featured on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at letsgooutdoors.ca. Remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the Report a Poacher line. Till next time, I'm Michael Short. Let's go outdoors. I know where I want to be Outside wild and free Let's go outdoors Let's go outdoors
go outdoors. 